Well, I'm a doctor at Amsterdam Shalena, or Evan Shalena, which is simpler. Um, I'm working in the energy sector in Greece uh, for the last 23 years. I've been active as a senior officer in public power cooperation first, and then as a special advisor of the Secretariat of the National Regulator of Greece. In the meantime, I have my PhD in the Sorbonne University, and uh, I'm publishing my research work in uh, peer-reviewed journals in international conference staff, and I'm also working as an evaluator for the European Commission in all kinds of uh, EU proposals, like evaluating life proposals, horizon proposals, um, energy facility for ACP countries, you name it. <laughs> and I also rather take some consultancy jobs, like uh, one uh, we had for the climate uh, change and the energy impact assessment in the Black Sea region. And I'm currently based in um, Fiji, really. I live in Fiji. I'm here in Australia for a visit in the University of Sunshine Coast, but I really reside in Fiji and uh, that was a place, splendid opportunity for me to see what exactly is climate change and what the cyclone can bring over, as we have experienced one cyclone two weeks ago. And uh, I would just like to say that somebody who has not lived in this region really is not capable to understand what climate change means in terms of uh, natural catastrophe and social and economic impacts. Here are the questions for you, and I, I'm assured they're going to be sort of covered in the presentation. Please give us an explanation of energy intensity and how it uh, differs from the term energy efficiency, uh, and how do, ener how do high energy intensity and low energy efficiency adversely affect energy costs to industry and households? I hope the economists here are ready to take notes on that. Uh, what are the factors that influence renewable energy growth and decline? What are the factors that could convert the results of renewable energy generation from mediocre into what we call a success story? What is the renewable energy development forecast at a regional European and international level? What are, uh, this is a, a regional question which is good, what are the main sources of funding for renewable energy development in the Balkans? Should national and EU funds be regarded as the first funding sources to turn to, or are there alternative options? What are the common features, as well as the differences, in renewable energy development in the different Balkan countries? And finally, using examples from other economic regions, such as the Black Sea region and the Pacific region, which you know well, obviously, uh, how can the development of common energy generating features build a successful renewable energy network alliance? At the slide two, really, we see that the energy intensity is uh, really a measure of the energy efficiency of a nation's economy. It is calculated as units of energy per unit of GDP. So high energy intensities indicate a high price or cost of converting energy into GDP. Um, well, energy efficiency is one of those factors which, which can impact energy intensity. So it's not the same. When we talk about energy intensity, we're not really talking about energy efficiency. Actually, they are contract contradictory concepts at which we can see, for example, at the slide three. Um, here at slide three, um, we see, a, say, the concept like a nation, nation that is highly economically productive with mild and temporary weather and uses fuel efficient vehicles, supports carpools, mass transportation, or walks, or rides bicycles will have a far lower energy intensity than a nation that is economically unproductive with extreme weather conditions required heating or cooling, etc. And I have two examples for you here. In the US, for example, the energy consumption in 2004 was about 105,200 PG. The total GDP that year was uh, like $11.75 trillion dollars and the per capita GDP is $40,100. So if the population is around 290 million, 291 million people, then the energy density is 9,024 kilojoules per dollar. 
Then we have Bangladesh, which is an underdeveloped country. Uh, the energy consumption from all sources was just 0.64 uh, each day. The total GDP was just $275.5 billion, and the per capita GDP was $2,000 per capita. Now, if population in Bangladesh is like 144 million people, then the energy uh, intensity is 2,113 uh, kilojoules per dollar. Thank so, you. Now we, now we know how you calculate that. That's interesting. Sorry? We now know how you calculate that number, which yes. I've never seen before, so thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so this is actually, we see that the uh, underdeveloped countries have a, um, uh, will have a higher energy intensity than developed countries, um, which is actually a concept which is totally different than the energy efficiency. Um, now, uh, so for Balkan, for the Balkan region, since uh, Balkan conventional energy sources are energy intensive and highly inefficient as well as costly, therefore high energy intensity and low energy efficiency affect energy costs to industry and households. Um, I think that's um, interesting to uh, refer a bit to those new world tendencies which can influence the whole energy story. Um, we have to, to say that we are very uh, grateful that fossil fuels are in the scene because they, have, uh, they are helping a lot with energy security, energy uh, autonomy, and, and uh, they provide a constant energy supply to everybody. The problem is that the whole social and economic background, worldwide background, is changing. And uh, I think that now renewable energy are going to be demanded more than anything else, really. We can see that uh, uh, it's not a problem of Greece, a world, it's a worldwide problem. The world is now dominated by refugee seekers. You can see there are some uh, statistical numbers uh, in the slide six. You can see that one in 122 people is now either a refugee or seeking asylum. If this population of refugees were a country, it will be the world's 24th largest country. Uh, that's a number we've never seen. Thank you. Yes. Um, we, you can see that 42,500 is the average number of persons displaced each day within 2014 only. Half of all refugees are children. And 1.9 million is the number of Syrian refugees now in Turkey. You know what does this mean? This slide means really that uh, there are huge geopolitical problems. And I would like to do a parenthesis here, which is not mentioned right now in the slide, but having heard first uh, Mr. Katsis, for example, from Vespas, Mr. Katsis from Vespas, um, you know, all this natural gas is coming from those countries that, where we can observe those problems. So I'm not really sure, I'm not confident that natural gas is going to be the answer in the future. Is because actually of those issues. Um, you can see, for example, those social transitions in the slide seven. And very interesting enough, you can see the slide eight, that uh, the social issue of refugees might change the renewable energy use forever. You know that now one of the biggest needs in camps where refugees are hosted is the search of a signal. You know that there are solar panels distributed in all those camps, so as they are allow refugees to have a signal in their phones. It looks it sounds a bit silly if you think about it, like this is one of the most demanded renewable energy use right now, but this is the truth. Um, like Mrs. I saw 14 says from Syria, you know, I brought my charger. They are only allowed to bring one thing with them when they travel. And she brought her charger and she's desperate for solar panel so she can connect in the camp and talk to somebody that she knows in Sweden. Um, there's also a need for solidarity now. And uh, in slide 11, 
people feel alone and in slide 12 people feel lost now and in slide 13 there's no room anymore for religions and for philosophical searches the problem is now survival you can see in the slide uh, 14 how living standards are changing you know um those pictures this contain yourself talking about containers there are going to be containers our living spaces in the future what but we have to self power with energy art is also um it's also coming another pile of uh, the new days nowadays life in uh, slide 16 uh, education and research shifts happen now there are the demands for high quality standards and excellence in international uh, outlets and innovative research paths people are talking for innovation now and all the funds are going to be turned into innovation there are going to be also huge educational opportunities to e-learning and academia so the educational plan is really changing around the world uh, another shift that I think we should mention here is that the funding is going to be uncompromised. You know, all the universities I'm working with recently, they're talking about lack of funds, as funds should be orientated towards social problems. There are not enough funds for research. So now we're not going to ask where the money is coming from. We'll just ask for money to do research. Um, we're going to see also a high, high level of market, market transitions that are going to happen the whole time. We're going to see transitions from, we have already seen transitions or efforts for transitions from cooperations of monopolistic character to cooperations with separate cost centers. Um, there's going to be huge ownership questions like who is controlling the national electricity state of the art? For example, now in Greece, in the past, it was PPC, the Power Public Corporation. Then we have tried to open the market, to liberalize the market. Did we open the market? I'm not that sure. I can see a oligopolistic character right now. I can see some developers that dominate the renewable energy um, scene of Greece, for example. Who, so who is owning the national electricity state of the art? Markets are moving the whole time, okay? We're talking about dynamics now. We're not talking about stability. We are watching shifts in working patterns. We're going to see a huge increase of technical workshop, workforce eager to learn because of the refugees that have, have, have flooded EU. We are going to see cooperatives, collaborations between all type of stakeholders. It's not going to be now only the state and the developers that are going to um, decide for the electricity status anymore. It's going to be all types of stakeholders which are, we are going to decide for the electricity. We are going to see public-private partnerships. Uh, we are trying the public sector where I've been working. We have tried very much to bring in um, working patterns and ethic patterns from the private sector. We were orientated towards customer satisfaction more than the satisfaction of the minister, for example. For tax reasons, we're going to see an opening towards more transparent procedures. So things are not going to be hidden anymore. And the 40% of the workforce in the future is going to be based on freelancer mainly, rather than employees on in the public sector. We will also experience public but new business models that will really benefit the renewable energy sector. For example, uh, who could ever imagine of Indian villager grandmothers in the slide 21, who would climb on the roofs carrying toolkits and solar panels, where in India, 32 million people live off grid. This means that India should Indians should be educated on how to put together a solar panel. So in India right now there are those solar mamas who are doing this job, and there are grandmothers that they have been trained for six months in uh, the college of Rajasthan, and now they are capable of building together um, solar panels. 
Another business that is starting to flourish in, and actually it was Bill Gates that has started first uh, to, to flourish around the world, is a compassion. Compassion sells a lot. It actually, the Salt uh, magazine, which I have bought recently in London, my, one of my trips in London, was giving a list of the businessmen, the most richest businessmen of the world, who are, have sold, have done business on compassion and have earned millions and billions out of those business. Um, because for the new era, as we see in the slide 22, and as Mr. Lee Williams say, the scope for measuring national happiness goes far beyond gross domestic product. I have some examples for you on how to make money out of compassion, um, which is through habitat creation, entrepreneurship, food security. Um, and we see at the slide 24 that efficiency matters more than money. You can see here the examples of USA vs Costa Rica. For example, USA life expectancy is 78 years, whereas in Costa Rica is 79 years. The ecological footprint of US is 7.2, whereas in Costa Rica is 2.5, which is the most efficient economy, US or Costa Rica? Also, in the new world that's going to come, especially for patterns for our regions, we're going to see a lot of EU skepticism. There are doubts about EU policy, as uh, my uh, uh, latest research has proved. Uh, it, was, she was, it was based on a questionnaire that was distributed in uh, like uh, 266 uh, uh, energy stakeholders. So, um, we're going to see EU policy actually has tried to push renewable energy towards people, has tried to create a market to define terminology, to cultivate a mentality. But I'm not sure that EU policy up to now has really responded to needs. Why? Because energy consumers were not often told the whole story. They were often told the one side of the story. Also, people were forced to deal with micropolitics, missing the big picture. For example, we were bombardized about what renewable energy means and how much we want it into our life without making this crucial link between renewable energy and fossil fuels. Um, so for end users, because this is our ultimate goal, end users and not developers of the state, for end users, energy has started to be a very complex issue. They have started to miss the whole forest. They wouldn't understand how those EU guidelines and you know directives would link to customer needs. So they have started really to have them. There has been an EU skepticism around. Um, therefore, we have seen we are going to start seeing some shift on public administration. The public administration is going to start changing guard rope. They're going to start uh, being more uh, uh, oriented towards uh, political feasibility analysis approaches, advocacy evaluation. They're going to start working on new management schemes, or doing practices from private to public sector, all things uh, that are, is going to make the public sector much more efficient and much more customers oriented. There's also time for accountability. You know, when somebody is asked who wants change, everybody's raising the hand. But who wants to change? Nobody raises the hand. So let's come now to the in the Balkan region. And I would like to say a few words about things I have noticed during my missions. Um, the, the Balkan region is like 136 million people, who generates like 140, 1.46 trillion dollars. This is an important um, outcome. I have been to all those countries through with the European Commission. I was honored to send me for lectures to ministries in Serbia, Romania, Albania, Serbia, Kosovo, Turkey, um, and I have seen 
the difference that I'm pointing out at the slide uh, 35. I've seen a different degree of information of electricity actors, public authorities and users. I have seen a different degree of maturity of electricity systems and electricity national frameworks. Some were more mature, some were less mature. Some countries had a bigger difficulty to incorporate EU guidelines, some other countries found it easier. And also there was a different type of internal and external political problems to deal with. There have been similarities as well. Um, I have seen in all those countries, I have seen a strong state control and a central, very strong central governmental planning. I have seen also a nationally isolated way of thinking. People in Albania would think Albania. They wouldn't think of Kosovo, they wouldn't think of Greece, they wouldn't think of Bulgaria. Uh, private enterprises felt hopeless in those countries. They didn't feel that they had the support they needed from the state. I have also seen eager people to share and to learn. Um, I have seen the existence of significant comparative advantages that you don't really see in Europe. For example, there, were, there was a strong um, will out of donors to give a help to Albania or there were abundant fuel resources in Bulgaria, or there were strong ties between Europe and Romania. Also Balkan, as you say, as you know, Balkan states enjoy an excellent geostrategic position. And also they think in this way, of this geostrategic way. And this is the way of dealing with issues as well. Um, a similarity, como similarities, political problems that are everywhere in Balkan states, and also a difficulty in absorption of EU and international funds. There's also a medium low individual GDP per capita. People in Balkans are trying to do too much with too little. Um, Having said so, I think that, to my opinion, the only way to go on with uh, energy transitions and to incorporate renewable energy in the energy um, scene of those countries is regional alliance, a regional alliance. What do we have in mind if we want to build a regional alliance for Balkan states? That stakeholders come with different views. A microwave looks different to an engineer, to a designer, to a customer, to a house assistant. This also has been proved by my last research paper. You know, we, up to now, EU policy was um, viewing uh, stakeholders, the stakeholders, like they are the same. They're not the same, they have different views. Another thing that we have to bear in mind is that stakeholders in Balkans come from different cultures. Okay, people see things differently. Also, stakeholders come with different arguments. There are arguments against nuclear, against oil, against coal, against renewable. So, um, I have done a bit search, a bit of search of uh, renewable energy needs in that defined in the Balkans. And I have some relevant suggestions for regional collaboration. Before that, I would like to tell you, um, this is a slide that I have just incorporated, so you don't have it, but uh, we have elaborated the climate change vulnerability and energy assessment review for the Black Sea, which are actually 12 countries spanning Europe and Central Asia, who have uh, created a regional energy and climate response roadmap Country. and a framework for key regional institutions, which included the situational analysis of the region in terms of drivers for change, a review of previously conducted vulnerability assessments, and the assessment of the climate impacts and vulnerability. And this is how I am able now to come with some suggestions for the uh, Balkan region. So, a need that was identified in the Balkan region was the potential for small hydro and uh, we have also observed, it has also been observed, extremely high transmission and distribution losses due to aging infrastructure. 
So a suggestion of mine, let's say, is that um, there should be more measurements of potential and performance in the area, and those should be based on stronger scientifically and technically countries that could take the lead. Greece, for example, is a country where uh, science excels when it comes to energy measurement and uh, uh, of potential. I see some amazing um, proposals that, that have been submitted to the EU for uh, evaluation and uh, they have come from universities like the National Technical University of Athens. So university as those ones could take the lead in measuring potential and performance of renewable energy in Balkans. Um, we should also work on resilience and redundancy concepts. That's a very important thing to be mentioned here. Not only we should build renewable energy projects, but we should think of how those projects are going to make the region more resilient and how uh, it's going to uh, attribute a redundancy measure. For example, um, we have two fridges in our house because what is going to happen if the one breaks down? You have to have one, you know, like a spare part. So those two principles should be very in mind when we create a regional collaboration. Another need identified except for the Balkans in particular. They say that the Balkans should improve the existing regulatory framework to enable renewable energy investors to develop and construct bankable projects. Well, from my 10 years experience in the regulator, I have to tell you that improving the existing regulator is very nice and wished for, but it takes time and uh, uh, involves too many stakeholders. It's very, very time consuming and we don't have the time to do that right now. So. Uh, suggestion, my suggestion is that uh, instead, what developers sh should do is to identify the main actors and their main position in the region and move across. For example, for the Pacific region, I'm going to tell you an example, okay? People should identify what donors act the way they do. What are they after? Do they exploit the system or just they are trying to fit it in the government's policy. You know, questions like that, they should be answered in order to build a regional collaboration. Also, check, check accountability issues. Who is finally accountable towards the taxpayers and at which degree? Governments can also be data inventories and increase transparency in processes. And this is how our regional collaboration can work, can be built. At the film level, and it's identified, it was like uh, renewable energy developers should work together and uh, both on market level and uh, all with individual projects, sponsors, etc. etc. Okay, a suggestion would be that developers should identify the main regional priorities in the area and how renewable energy can be linked to those uh, priorities. Um, also, identify the link between government and policy and prioritization of resources. We shouldn't build renewable energy projects, you know, away without further examining this link between policy and existing resources. And also, an intersectional collaboration should be promoted. We are seeing the building up of renewable energy projects, but we don't really think them in relation to the existing sectoral economic policies in the region. A very important thing also is to link renewable energy with social concerns, which um, relate to food security, jobs, health care, education, because those are the main problems right now apart from the energy ones. In the finance institution level, a need that has been identified is that uh, there is a need for work with selected financial institutions to improve their internal capacities and knowledge of various new language technologies. A suggestion would be that we should identify the financial institutions with a renewable energy history in the Balkan area. We should use their lessons to spread around the Balkan area good practices. And at this point, I would like to say that it's very important that we work on sustainability principles. We should think of the future. And we should opt for long-term 
achievements rather from you know just building renewable energy projects around. Um, in the slide 47, uh, I would suggest that the prior homework should be done if we want to build a regional collaboration. That should be the identification of cooperative advantages of each country, what each country has to offer in a renewable energy regional collaboration. Uh, we should identify the energy autonomy special status of each country. For example, Bosnia and Herzegovina make their electricity needs with domestic power sources, while other countries, such as Albania, for example, import to up to 50% of their energy supply um, from other countries. And we should conduct this road analysis. Which are the strengths, the weaknesses, the threats, and the opportunities for the Balkan area? That's a very interesting exercise to do which uh, I have done myself already, and there are many, many uh, nice um, conclusions to be out of there. So, in the slide 48, I'm not going to read the slide, but you can see the cost of climate change, which is huge. Um, just to mention that the economic losses for from disasters could be up to $300 billion US a year. And I would like to stress here that the climate change cost is going to be much higher for countries with lower income or lower GDP per capita. Um, and, uh, Something that I would like also to stress is uh, that uh, the ecological footprint from the unsustainable overconsumption of energy and natural capital now exceeds the planet's biocapacity by nearly 50% already. Still, um, we have some reasons to remain optimistic. We see that the world, the world comes now where investors spend their capital on renewable energy, not because they want to protect future generations, as would happen up to now, but because renewable energy makes the best economic sense. Uh, because this happens now because um, wind and solar uh, prices go down, because uh, the emission trading mechanism are going to to uh, higher up the prices of oil and of fossil fuels in general because there are those targets that are going to higher up the uh, prices of oil and uh, fossil fuels in general and because of those oil geopolitical concerns that uh, uh, are going to drive oil and natural uh, gas high as well. Uh, so the market itself drives a transition towards renewable energy and households with the situation in their own hands. And that is good because uh, something that I would like to stress out here is that, fine, natural gas is great and uh, like night is not, not like night mostly, natural gas is great, but the problem with natural gas and with lignite and with oil is that if you think about it, they're all controlled by third parties and not by the end user himself. So we're going to reach a moment where developers, state, and um, third countries are going to control the energy scene around us, but what about the end users? Only the renewable energy self-supply, the self-produced uh, electricity and energy in general can give a control and transparency to the end user. So um, households will really get a situation in their own homes. If not, then they are going to be called to pay high tariffs in their invoices, like it happens now in, uh, for example, in Greece, where uh, people just see, you know, their electricity bills gets more and more increased without really having control over those increases. Um, a last slide is the slide 50. I have noticed, I think you have noticed as well, that now there is more than ever there is an unprecedented way to move on and do things. So we are all, uh, you know, lucky to see all those dynamics happening around us and we want to contribute to those dynamics. And as a last slide, I would like just to um, 
show you which were my sources of references for the above presentation. And it was those three magazines that I had the honor to read uh, lately. So this is where I have taken all my pictures and uh, graphs, etc., etc. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. If you can, I hope you can hear the applause in the audience here. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Dr. Michalena, and we really appreciate you giving us the, the global aspect to this, uh, to, to this meeting because really we haven't had the opportunity to do a session on two continents before, so thank you.